Winemaker and a filmmaker are really not very different. They're both artists and they both leave a unique and indelible mark on their work. The Here's a shot I took of Fred McMurray just recently. This was taken five years ago on the set of The Mating Game with Debbie Reynolds and her new baby. Go to sleep, my little honey. Mommy has to make some money. Here's a shot I took ten years ago on location with Tyrone Power and Linda Donnell. This was taken 20 years ago at an Academy Award dinner. Norma Shearer, Herbert Marshall, and Clark Gable. And here's a picture I took over 30 years ago at a party when I first arrived in Hollywood. The two greatest, Laurel and Hardy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The film you're about to see is not intended to be an epical history of Hollywood. It is not a rehash saga of the movies. It is merely a day-by-day -day personal film diary of pictures that I assure you you've never seen before and probably will never see again. Actually, this show has no deeper purpose than to call back pleasant memories of a lively group of people who worked hard and played hard in developing a great industry. Recently, we had a preview of this show. And one TV columnist summed it up this way. He said, everybody over to Ken Murray's house for home movies. Well, I read someplace that amateur photographers are America's largest hobby group. And I must say that they are very well represented in this town. You can see this show has a very expensive camera crew. I have no idea how Cary Grant or any of the others were bitten by the camera bug. But with me, it was very simple. I merely started taking home movies out here to send back to the folks. At first, as an obscure, vaudeville actor, taking sightseeing buses through studios and trying to stand in front of newsreel cameramen at premieres. Of course, later on, when I got my first part in a movie at Paramount, opposite Helen Twelve Trees, a long forgotten little opus appropriately entitled Disgraced. Get a load of that leading man. There's a method actor with no method. But there was some compensation. I did get some great pictures around that time. Here's a shot taken over 30 years ago on the Paramount Studio Street. For you Hennessy fans, that's Jackie Cooper when he played Skippy. He was warming up for a little publicity stunt with Groucho and Harpo Marx. That pretty starter is Carol Lombard. Life around the studio seemed a lot more fun in the early 30s. Can you imagine Wall Street standing for a caper like this today? You know who Jackie is waving at? Nick Lucas. He came over to have lunch with me. That fellow at the finish line is Charles Lawton. Harpo really gave Jackie a bad time. Yes, there was a spirit of gaiety and excitement on the lot that day. I don't know why that guy's spending so much time on his nose when it's the mouth that needs the attention. Joey Brown was making his first talking. And so was Cecil B. DeMille. I think this was Cleopatra starring Claudette Colbert.
is a nice guy, Johnny Weissman. He was making a date for a premiere that night. Everyone on the lot was talking about that opening. It was a new picture called She Done Him Wrong. And no one was more excited than this young man. He was playing the male lead opposite Paramount's newest sensation, Mae West. The voluptuous blonde with the swaying hips and the pungent quotes. This was a big night for May. She thanked Sid Groman for the use of the theater and hoped everyone would like her new picture. If you watch very closely, you can almost hear her say, why don't you come up and see me sometime? May could well be proud of this moment. The whole town turned out to pay her homage. There's the king of Hollywood, Douglas Fairbank Sr. And wherever you saw the king, you were bound to see the queen, Mary Pickford with Luella Parsons. Clark Gable with Rhea Gable and Ruth Eddy. Carol Lombard and a group of friends. Walter Houston. There he is with Jack Dempsey and Max Baer. Russ Colombo with a beautiful Sally Blaine. She's Loretta Young's sister. Looks like Weissmuller got his date. Loopy Valet. All right, so I'm a bad photographer. I cut off his head. And of course, George Raft was there. Mae West made her first picture with him. The master of ceremonies was a very young Dick Powell. I've taken a lot of pictures of Dick through the years. I was there when he took his first plunge at his new home in Toluca Lake. I remember when he got his first car, his first baby, and his first suit with a belt in the back. I was with him when he caught his first marlin off Catalina Island. This was a very enjoyable trip. Weather great, fishing excellent. That's the bait. That's the size I usually bring home. Man, that's fast action. Dick's got a strike. Keep the line taut, Dick. Don't give him any slack. These are always anxious moments when they dance on their tail, trying to throw the hook. This was a dandy, over 200 pounds. Boy, the chances a happy fisherman will take when he's excited. Yes, in the early 30s, Catalina was the place to fish. And Malibu was the place to own a beach house. It was a badge of rank to be a member of this colony, well worth the 25-mile drive to and from work every day. It was Shantytown Deluxe, where each shanty cost thousands of dollars. That's Arthur Lake, one of my first friends in Hollywood. You know, digging up old pictures like this can be quite a discouraging shock to your ego. I'd always sort of remembered myself as looking like this fellow in a bathing suit. Well, maybe not exactly. That's Joel McRae. And certainly not like this fellow. That's Buddy Rogers. Here's a couple more Malibu Beach combers. John Bowles, Buster Collier, and Robert Wolseley. As time went on, in addition to Malibu, many of the stars built big homes further down the beach. That's Cary Grant. Sounds like Cary's having a party.
It isn't often that you can catch this guy napping. And here's another rare shot. Nowadays, you very seldom see a picture of Gertrude Lawrence, a charming girl. In the same group, Gregory Ratzel and the beautiful Claire Windsor. How would you like to have this lovely young lady for a neighbor? That's Norma Shearer. She just dropped in from next door. And Irene Dunn came right from the studio. Here is another picture of the host. But this was taken a long ways from the beach. This was on location at Lone Pine, California for a picture called Gunga Din. Man, I never saw so much action. That young man is the director, George Stevens. Victor McLaughlin was in that picture. No doubt about this being a home movie, Vic is sure out of character. And there's the fellow who played the title role, Gunga Din. He's one of the finest character actors on the screen, Sam Jaffe. Today, you TV watchers know him as Dr. Zorba. When this picture was taken, Ben Casey was eight years old. Cary Grant tells a very funny story about working with this elephant. Her name was Annie, and he said he spent so much time with her and she became so attached to him that every night she would trumpet and bellow and carry on, keeping the whole company awake until he went over and slept beside her. That Annie had a pretty good technique, using Cary Grant for a tranquilizer. Beautiful country up there at Lone Pine. I didn't take these shots. They were taken by Grant himself. You'd never guess who's holding that snake. Another star out of Gunga Din. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Nice shot. I think that Grant is a little more artistic than I am. And here's another artistic photographer, Lou Ayers. He has quite a collection himself. The reason he was so amused when I was taking this picture recently is that he was kidding me about the first shot he ever took of me with his camera. There it is. Portrait of an early American hot rod. Don't laugh. Beneath that pile of tin there throbs a Model T. Of course it doesn't throb unless you give it artificial respiration. We took a ride up Hollywood Boulevard that day. This is the way it looked in the early 30s. There's the old Hollywood Hotel at Hollywood and Highland. And there's the number one citizen of Beverly Hills, Mary Pickford. Most of the big stars lived in the hills of Beverly. Here's the home of the most dynamic redhead ever to streak across the Hollywood sky, Clara Bow. And there's the it girl with her husband, Rex Bell, right after they were married. I like Adolf Zucker's description of Clara Bow. He said, she danced even when her feet were not moving. Some part of her was always in motion, if only her big rolling eyes. Here's what happens when you have a little film left on the roll. That's a very young Lou Ayres making like Tarzan. Only in home movies could you catch Lou in a mood like this. Actually, he's always been a very serious young man. It's interesting to note that Lou Ayers got started in movies playing opposite Hollywood's biggest star. This was the first day on the set. And the star, Greta Garbo. Naturally, I didn't take these pictures. These are from Lou's own collection. The movie was called The Kiss, and it was the last silent picture made at MGM. The set was completely enclosed, and a violin and organ were playing the music you are now hearing. Lou said he will never forget this day. This was the first scene they shot, and to add to the tension, just before he went on the set, he was informed that a very nervous director had three other young actors standing by, just in case. At this moment, Lou Ayres was 19 years old, Greta Garbo, 22. When you've collected home movies for over 30 years, you naturally accumulate an awful lot of pictures. 
I'd moved around a lot in the last three decades, so locating and looking at miles of film for interesting shots was a king-size scavenger hunt. It's like rummaging through an old attic. You turn up a lot of junk, but occasionally, if you're lucky, you may find a rare masterpiece. And I think I did. It was a long-forgotten can of film. Lifting the lid was almost like opening King Tut's tomb. For inside were pictures which no one had ever seen before. Home movies, taken years ago within the confines of the largest, costliest, and most imposing private estate on the North American continent, San Simeon. The fabled citadel of William Randolph Hearst. Located a little over 200 miles up the Pacific coast from Hollywood, on a high peak of the Santa Lucia Mountain. This past summer, I revisited San Simeon. The last time I was here was by invitation, but today it's open house for everyone in the world. I paid my admission fee and was one of the 2,000 tourists that day who took the five mile bus trip up the Enchanted Hill. This castle opened Christmas Eve, 1925, was the focal point of the giant Hearst Ranch, at that time spreading over 300,000 acres, nearly half the size of the state of Rhode Island. La Casa Grande, housing the largest private collection of art objects in the world, valued at over $50 million. Mr. Hearst called it his little hideaway. Last time I saw this pool, those beautiful marble columns from Italy had just been uncrated and put in place. I slipped away from the tour for a moment to see if there were any changes in the guest houses. No, my little bungalow was still there. Imagine me sleeping in Cardinal Richelieu's bed. Today, San Simeon is a state monument. But during its heyday, which spanned the roaring 20s and the fabulous 30s, it was the gathering place of the Hollywood immortal. With guests like Marie Dressler, seen here clowning with the host, William Randolph Hearst. That outfit she's wearing looks like a flea-bitten version of Touch a Mink. That pretty blonde over there with the short bobbed hair is Marion Davies. Although she typified glamour on the screen, at San Simeon she joined in the fun. Marion Davies was one of the best liked members of the motion picture colony. Beloved by everyone who knew her, she endowed many charities still in existence. That's Charlie Chapman kidding around. The man coming out of the door at that moment was the mayor of New York City. Jimmy Walker. If these pictures seem to reflect a certain frivolity, you must remember they were taken at that wonderful carefree period in our history. The First World War had ended, and the second one was nowhere in sight. That youth on the right is Adolf Manju. Yes, notables from every walk of life visited San Simeon. That's Paul Block, the newspaper publisher, chatting with the mayor. The fellow kneeling down in front of this group is George K. Arthur, the comedian. And the attractive girl on the left in the print dress is Hedda Hopper. Standing next to Hedda is the founder of America's largest bank, A.P. Giannini. John Gilbert and his wife, Virginia Bruce. Claire Windsor and Dolores Del Rio. They're down at the tennis court, watching Chaplin hit a few to build children. That teenager on the right is Carol Lombard. Nothing pleased the host more than when everybody got out of doors in the afternoon to take part in some group activity. He was proud of San Simeon and eager for his guests to enjoy it to the full. 
Many people have the sense of acquisitive possessiveness, but William Randolph Hearst was the only man ever able to indulge it to the hill. But it was a strange paradox that this fighting giant of journalism with all his vast collection of material wealth should also have a tender passion for the treasures of nature, flowers, trees, and animals. Yes, Mr. Hurst was a happy man at San Simeon. Whether he was conducting business with his secretary or welcoming a famous guest like Lindy. In town, he was very reticent about having his picture taken. But up here, he seemed to have no objection. He'd even kid about it. Part of the daily routine was to move the guests to the adjoining zoo to witness the feeding of the animals. was at its peak. The zoo and game preserve, the largest private collection in the world, was established on 2,000 San Simeon acres, protected from the guests by an eight-foot high wire fence 10 miles long. Visitors were made aware of Mr. Hurst's tenderness toward animals when they drove up the mountainside as they were confronted by large signs admonishing them to always drive slowly. As Hedda Hopper once said, a visit to the Hurst Ranch was a ticket to Never Never Land. Never has there been such a place, and never will we see its likes again. As an animal collector, Mr. Hurst started modestly with a herd of rare, pure, white fallow deer imported from Asia. Then, patriotically, he added Montana black buffalo, but had to go far afield again to gather exotic animals from all over the world. And when these animals stopped in the middle of the road, you stopped. Yes, there was hardly anything in the Bronx Zoo or any other great American collection that could not have been found at San Simeon at its peak. If you were with us at Malibu Beach a little earlier in this show, you'll recognize my old friend, Arthur Lake. Camels or horses, he's always been the bravest in our set. Watch out, Dagwood, or you'll get your arm in a sling again. Seriously, I'll always be indebted to Arthur for helping to make possible many of these pictures. He was the one who introduced me to Mr. Hurst. And that's Arthur's pretty wife, Pat Lake. She's Marion Davies' niece and was a great favorite of Mr. Hurst. She was also very helpful in persuading the host to pose for some of these pictures. Before I left that day, I had to take one more shot of that main entrance. Everything seemed so much the same that I almost expected our host to come out of the door. This next shot was Mr. Hurst's own idea. He said, let's make believe the camera's running backwards. As the time came to leave, and we started down from the Enchanted Hill, a familiar quotation came to my mind. I think it was Kipling who said, the tumult and the shouting die, the captains and the kings depart. It seems so true here at San Simeon. Long after its builders, vast newspaper chain and political influences are forgotten, he will be remembered as America's greatest art collector and the creator of San Simeon. I hope you don't mind me bringing you out on the stage like this, do you? Mind if you hadn't brought me out here, I'd have slugged you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean, Kurt? Well, I tell you, Ken, I just went up to Albany to visit my family. I have my six sisters and my mother. And, you know, I, I'm beginning to think they think I'm rather a failure because I'm not on television. <laughs> you know what my mother said to me? She said, uh, Kirk, now, why aren't you a big star like Ken Murray? Oh. <laughs> A natural reaction. <laughs> what, what, what is, uh, seriously, what does she mean by that? Well, I'll tell you, Ken. Uh, she figures it out rather accurately. You see, my pictures come to Albany 
about, uh, oh, once, twice, sometimes three times a year, whereas the Ken Murray show gets there about every week. Yes. So every therefore, week. she wants to see me on television. Well, your ma's a real television fan, then. She watches our yes. show, is that right? Well, she's watching it right now. That's why I'm here. I wanted she her is. to know that I know some big stars. Uh, Would you hey, mind? Ma, look at me. <laughs> That scene, of course, was taken some years ago. The occasion being Kirk Douglas's first appearance on television. At a time, I might add, when Hollywood frowned upon its stars appearing on the little 10-inch monster. Ten years passed before I got any more film on Kirk, but recently I caught up with him in the forecourt of Groman's Chinese Theater. He was signing the cement autograph book, carrying on a tradition that is one of the few active reminders of the glamour that made Hollywood great. Kirk Douglas became the 137th movie star to put his handprints in this Hall of Fame. Now I know what those poor newsreel cameramen go through. Shooting from the hip with a camera in a crowd like this is not the easiest thing in the world. But Kirk was very helpful. He arranged for me to get a very close shot when he put his hands in that sticky, gooey cement. He, he pulled a funny gag on me. Just before it all started, he said, Ken, this personal appearance stuff makes me nervous. Stick close to me, will you? And I did. For three days, my barber had to shave me with a chisel. This was only the second time I'd ever attended one of these shindigs. The first time was over 30 years ago. I'll never forget what a kick this was, to see Tom Mix in person. He'd been my boyhood idol on the silent screen since those days when I would go to the Nickelodeon with my pop every Saturday afternoon. I got to know him pretty well in his later years, this film was taken at his ranch in 1940. Tom was the first of the true cowboys and had a real exciting life. He began punching cattle at the age of 12. At 18, he was a rough rider with Teddy Roosevelt, then a Kansas sheriff and later a Texas ranger. I had to send this picture back to the folks. That's the original horse, Tony, who was 30 years old at that time. Tom Mix told me that day that he came to Hollywood in 1910, determined to make a million dollars. Well, he made it. And spent much of it on high-spirited horses, high-priced cowboy duds, and high-powered automobiles. You know, it's ironic that this man who had risked his life hundreds of times in daredevil stunts on horses should meet his death in an automobile. He was killed in this car two weeks after this picture was taken. And here's the fellow who introduced me to Tom, Johnny Mac Brown, quite an athlete himself. All-American football player, movie star, and one of the nicest fellows you ever met. Pretty fair horseman, too. Oh, well, you can't win them all. I lived with Johnny Mac for a while. We went to a lot of rodeos together. I got pictures of Hoot Gibson and Buck Jones. We even visited Hopalong Cassidy on location. I'm sure Bill Boyd never dreamed when he was making these pictures that someday he would revolutionize an industry that hadn't even been invented yet. I went on quite a western kick around that time. Got me a white horse like Hoppy's. Learned to spin a little rope. So that in the early 40s, when Jack Warner invited me to be the MC on a junket to Virginia City for a big premiere, I was really in the mood. This was a real exciting trip. In my whole life, I've never seen so many movie stars corralled together. There's just too many here to name individually, but I got some good close-ups later on. There's the star of the picture, Errol Flynn. First stop, Reno. This was surely a great way to exploit pictures. How come we don't do this no more? We were all a little punchy by the time we hit Virginia City. That's Wayne Morris. 
Alan Hale agrees. He had a good time. Humphrey Bogart and Mayo Masal. Jane Wyman. Mary Astor. My next door neighbor back home. There's Hoppy again. The grand old man of the movies, Hobart Boswell. And a good friend, Leo Carrillo. On the way home, Warner Brothers arranged a side trip to Sun Valley. You know, when I was a kid, my ambition was to be a locomotive engineer. Riding in the cab of this Union Pacific engine was the nearest I ever came to. Sun Valley. This has always been Hollywood's favorite place for winter sports. Here's a pretty gal on vacation. June Allison. Errol Flynn was all set to relax, but they got him out to make the proverbial snowman. That pretty blonde sneaking up on the right is Martha O'Driscoll. When she hit Flynn with that hunk of snow, she certainly started something. They really gave her a bad time. <laughs> That's Johnny Weissman. Wayne Morris. Well, you see what Johnny does to that poor girl. That's Reggie Gardner. This is one of those wild Hollywood parties you're always reading about. And there's some guests from the hotel watching the goings on. Rory Calhoun in the middle. The gal on the right, of course, is Lucille Ball. These aren't the only pictures I have of Lucy. Here's one taken long before television. And here's another, taken on the set of a movie called Fancy Pants. That's George Marshall, the director, and Lucy Standard. And there's her co-star, old Ski Nose Hope. <laughs> Looks like he's trying to read between the lines. Lucy has made quite a few pictures with Bob. Their latest one is Critics' Choice. This particular day, Lucy had to do a scene where she took some falls, and boy, did she work hard. Now, mine, that was just a rehearsal. All right, action. Uh-oh, something went wrong. And she's got to do it again. Someone once said, that Lucille Ball stands alone as the greatest comedian of our time. And that, and that goes for sitting down, too. Here's another part-time cowpoke from Hollywood. But this picture was taken a long ways from Sun Valley. I took this at the El Mirador Hotel in Palm Springs. That, of course, is Robert Taylor. The reason for the long sideburns is that he was making Camille with Greta Garbo. Throughout the years, it's been interesting to watch the movie colony migrate from Malibu by the sea to Sun Valley in the snow and then to Palm Springs on the desert. And here's the fellow who was, for the great part, responsible for the migration, Charlie Farrell, founder of the Racket Club. What started out in the 30s to be an intimate tennis club grew to be the most exclusive rendezvous for the Hollywood stars. In the late 40s, I spent my honeymoon here. As a matter of fact, that young lady walking around the pool is my new bride. This was Christmas time, 1948, and everyone was in a festive mood. Annie Bryce, beautiful Margaret Sullivan, Joan Davis. She was in rare form that day, full of fun. Van 
Alan Johnson picked the wrong time to try to sleep. Here's one of the prettiest girls ever to grace the screen, Donna Reed. Today, most people associate Donna with her TV husband and family. But in real life, this is the lucky guy, Tony Owen. I was so pleased everyone was so nice to Betty Lou. She really got a big kick out of meeting Frank Morgan. Edgar Bergen took her for a ride in his new plane, and Cary Grant invited her to play tennis. You know, a thing like this might make some husbands very jealous. But not me. Well, up to now, we pretty well covered the Hollywood scene as it lived and worked and played during a very lush and carefree period. Roughly that quarter of a century of miraculous prosperity between the arrival of sound pictures and the threat of the television age. Of course, I didn't take all these shots, and I may have mixed up some of the times and places, but after all, it's very difficult to remember everything that happened over that long a period. But I'm giving you the same treatment I gave my folks. I was never one to spoil a good story by the lack of a few facts. Naturally, my camera couldn't capture all that was happening throughout the years, so during the 12 months that it took me to prepare this show, I went through thousands of feet of home movies from the personal collections of these stars here in Hollywood. And this is as good a time as any to express my appreciation to all these friends for permitting me to add some of their exclusive film to my own personal collection. Film which obviously was only intended to be shown within the confines of their own living rooms for the amusement of their family and friends. And today, with Hollywood using the whole world for location, there's plenty of opportunity for these camera buffs to get very unusual pictures. Here's a fellow who had a most interesting experience in Africa, Eddie Albert. You are now going down the Ogawi River in French Equatorial Africa. Those slow-moving crocodiles are very deceptive. They can move much faster than you think, especially on dry land. Miles from civilization in a little settlement called Gabon is a small jungle hospital run by one of the most dedicated men of our time, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. I sure envy Eddie. What a great picture to hand down to your grandchildren. He can also tell them about the practice he got as a jungle babysitter. In the last year or so, I've taken a couple of overseas trips myself, but to places where the natives were a little more sophisticated. There's a fellow who likes to babysit, but he likes his babes a little older. That's Bob Cummings. I didn't do so bad with the native girls myself. But when Cummings went out for that surfing stuff, I went back to shooting pictures. He's pretty good, too. This was taken from an outrigger. Just to show you how the jet age has shrunk the world to a sleeper jump, one morning I took this picture of Bob riding a surfboard off Diamond Head. And 14 hours later, I took this picture of him riding a rickshaw in Hong Kong. Fourteen hours from there in Cairo, I took a picture of another Bob, Taylor, riding a camel. This picture was taken in St. Mark's Square in Venice. That's Jean Crane.
There's only one thing to do in this town. A ride in a gondola, soft music, and a pretty girl. Man, this is the life. But don't get excited. There's someone else in the boat. Her husband, Paul Brinkman. It was winter when we hit merry old England, and of all the unlikely people to meet at the Tower of London, especially where Anne Bolin had throat trouble, was this fella, Pat Boone. If there's any doubt that people around the world still regard Hollywood stars as the glamour symbol, they should have been with me in Nice this past summer. Hundreds of people lined the streets and cars were locked bumper to bumper watching Glenn Ford and Hope Lang shoot a picture called The Grand Duke and Mr. Pym. This location shot was taken on the shores of the Mediterranean halfway between Nice and Monte Carlo. They did a very interesting thing the day I was there. They were just about to shoot a scene where Glenn had to drive this sports car along the Moyer Cornish Road at a speed of 110 miles an hour. Now usually for the close-up of actors in an action scene like this, they take a process shot in the studio later on. But instead they had that special camera that you see strapped on the hood of the car and it was rigged up to start rolling when Glenn hit night. Another very interesting location was in West Berlin. That's Bill Holden and his director, George Seaton, making the counterfeit traitor in the actual locale of this true life story. And here's another guy who goes in for realism. That's John Wayne in Kenya, Africa, making Hatari. This shot is not in the picture. That's Duke just kidding around cowboy style. Yes, they're shooting movies all over the world, but they're still making great pictures in Hollywood. Just recently, I worked in one at the Disney studio called The Son of Flubber. It was a sequel to Disney's big comedy hit, The Absent-Minded Professor. Fred McMurray was the star. Fred seemed to get a kick out of my camera assistant. I had the whole family working that day. Those are my two daughters, Pammy and Jamie. Incidentally, the minute they got inside the studio, the first thing they wanted to do was to meet Uncle Walt. We finally tracked them down on the studio street. Walt Disney. Master of fantasy, weaver of dreams, and winner of 29 Academy Awards. When I tried to latch on to this trip around the studio, he said, this is for us kids only. You take the picture. But I hitched a ride in the rumble seat. For my two little girls, this must have seemed like a ride on the flying carpet. nearly died. He drove right through a movie set that was working. Incidentally, this is their first attempt at photography. Can't you tell? One of the things the kids wanted to see was how all these fantastic props are made. This is one of the new mechanical elephants. This particular prop is to mystify the patrons of Disneyland. It sure fooled the kids. I'll bet it could even fool another elephant. You know, it's almost like a symbol of the terrific growth of Disney. From a mouse to an elephant. As my two kids followed their favorite Pied Piper down the Zorro Street, 
It occurred to me that here is surely the Hans Christian Andersen of our time. Hollywood can well be proud of this man, who the mere mention of his name in any nation throughout the world brings a happy gleam of anticipation to all those who are young at heart. Needless to say, Walt Disney earned the eternal gratitude of a very proud daddy when he took time out from a busy schedule to show two wide-eyed youngsters the inside of the land of make-believe. But I don't think the girls were as impressed with daddy's heroics as they were when Fred McMurray invited them for a ride in the Flubber car. They kept saying to Fred, make it fly. They reckoned without the magic of Walt Disney. Guess who took this shot? Daddy, risking life and limb. That Glen Ford has nothing on us. Of course, my camera didn't start rolling until Fred hit nine miles an hour. Well, it looks like nothing much has changed after all in 30 years. I wound up right back where I was at the beginning of the show, riding a Model T. But as you folks probably gathered, these sentimental journeys through my hometown are really a labor of love. And I also feel as Hollywood becomes historical, fighting to preserve the glamorous tradition that made it so great, it is a time for reminiscence and remembrance of things past. It's true. Time puts a halo on a lot of things. Maybe, maybe Hollywood isn't or never was all I thought it to be. Maybe because I looked at my town through the other side of a home movie camera, I saw only the mink and not the plain old cloth coat. But one only sees magic when he's looking for magic. And so, whenever I want to recapture those days, I only have to turn out the lights in my living room, pull the drapes, and turn on my projector. There, glittering on the screen, I can see my town in its party dress and see again those who shone so vividly across the horizon. And now, here comes a young lady who has created a real sensation in the picture business, having won all kinds of awards as the number one newcomer of the year. And believe me, a swell gal with it. Take it from me, I know her for a long time. Miss Marilyn Monroe. Come on out here, Marilyn. Uh, <laughs> Marilyn, they, 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 it's so nice of you to come here. They, you know, they say that beauty is a thing of, that, uh, that a thing of beauty is a joy forever. I want to tell you, someday you're going to make a man a wonderful annuity. Now, come on over here a little closer. This is your television premiere, isn't it, Mario? That's right. It feels almost like making pictures. Ah, yeah. Listen, I want to tell you something. Up to this time, yeah. television has been a medium, yeah. but now I say it's well done. <laughs> now, Marilyn, I want to ask you one. <laughs> I want to ask you one thing. Uh, I wonder if after, you know, I know Marilyn. When's the first time we met? Tell us, tell the folks. Well, once you almost gave me a job. That's right. Do you remember? <laughs>
Hello. Oh, thank you, Jim. It's good to hear from you. Yes, I'll call her. Mary? She'll be here in just a minute. Hello? Jim, it seems like you've been away ages. That's wonderful. I know you had a grand trip. Will I go? It's a date. Bye-bye. A date with Jim. Now's the time to remind Dad about that new dress he promised me. You certainly should. Dad? Well, what's this? Daddy, you and I have important business in town. Remember that new dress? Well, seems to me I do recall something along those lines. Well, come on. You say it's the same as Joan Crawford wears in a new picture? It's styled the same, and it definitely reflects the Hollywood influence. Dad, may I have it? It's yours. And so, to this quiet little town, far from the metropolitan areas, the Hollywood influence reaches out to style and gown Mary, just as smartly as Joan Crawford is costumed for her role in the new film, Susan and God, in which she is co-starred with Frederick March. Oh, I forgot my take that away. That's out. Mm -mm. Well, don't tell me you're on the wagon, Susan. No, not at all. It's something much more spiritual than a wagon. You, you realize what you're doing, what you're promising? I'm promising to give you up forever, if I slip. Even if it Even if I only last a day or an hour, you win, I lose. We know that the ensemble worn by Joan Crawford in this preview flash from Susan and God was immediately responsible for Mary's selection of an outfit after the Susan mode. But why? And how did it happen? Simply because the motion picture has annihilated space, blotted out the backwoods, and banished what was once our custom to call the country. Today, the girl from the country is just as modern and dresses just as smartly as her big city sister. In Hollywood, style center of the world, celebrated designers create the film fashions that set the styles for all the world to follow. Fashion scouts are quick to seize upon the studio creations. They comb the pages of the movie magazines for advanced tips on the ever-changing cinema fashion parade. And it is not uncommon at a Hollywood preview to discover an artist hurriedly sketching in the semi-darkness of the theater, a dress that catches his fancy on the screen. Commercial designers pattern gowns reflecting the latest mode, and dress factories hum with frenzied activity. Materials are piled high, and as many as 25 coats or dresses are cut from the same pattern at the same time by keen circular blades, power-driven. Sewing machines sew a fast but straight seam. Buttonhole machines sing as they punch out millions of stitches every hour, and 20-pound irons mold the finished garment. Adrian, Hollywood's foremost studio designer, who creates the styles for the stars of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, probably has done more to influence style trends the world over than any other designer. The players at Metro are guided completely by his judgment. Adrian's designs for Vivian Lee and Waterloo Bridge are fascinating in their memory of 1914. Robert Taylor is co-starred with Miss Lee and Waterloo Bridge. Well, darling. Oh, Roy. Shall we face it? It's been so quick. Are you quite, quite sure? Myra, I was never so sure of anything in my life. In the moment that you left me after the air raid, I knew I must find you again. I found you and I'll never let you go. Does that answer you? The wardrobe for period pictures costs considerably more than for modern films, and from them often comes a fashion for today. The wardrobe expense for MGM's Pride and Prejudice probably will exceed $75,000. Greer Garson, most happily remembered as the lovable Mrs. Chips, and Laurence Olivier are co-starred with a noteworthy cast in Pride and Prejudice. I rather admired what you did this afternoon, Miss Elizabeth. Your resentment at what you believed to be an injustice showed courage and loyalty. I could wish I might possess a friend who would defend me as ably as Mr. Wickham was defended today. At this moment, it's 
difficult to believe that you're so proud. At this moment, it's difficult to believe that you are so prejudiced. To California's famous Death Valley, Metro Golden Mayor sent Wallace Berry and a big location company to film authentic scenes for 20 Mule Team, roaring and romantic saga of the early quest for adventure in an inferno of heat and desolation. Barrymore will face the camera soon in another exciting episode in the lives of Doctors Kildare and Gillespie. Exclusive and Southern, Maisie to you, is making ready to embark on another romantic adventure. This time she is Gold Rush Maisie. Bulletin, Metro Goldwyn Mayer soon will present the story of the Navy Seahawks, Flight Command. And so we bid goodbye to Hollywood style center of the world as another romance of celluloid comes to a close. Your daily newspapers and the marquee of your favorite theater will herald the showing in your city of the productions you have just seen in preview. And remember always that this big parade of more stars than there are in the heavens is your surest guide to the finest entertainment any theater can offer.
classic moment. How can you top it? I'm so sorry. You are about to see a great film, ladies and gentlemen. We make little bits of forever. We have friends all over the world because of this festival. It's like family. The 2020 TCM Classic Film Festival. Passes on sale November 21st. For more, visit tcm.com slash festival. Try one? Just keep it tight, I'm sold. Ready for it? Here. Hey, I'm Christian Bush from Sugarland. And I'm Brandon Bush, his brother. The Bush Brothers. With Sugarland, country music allowed us to go out and perform tour the world and then write with some of the great country music writers in the world. At the same time, I really want to be a composer. It's what I've always loved to do. And working with TCM was a great opportunity to learn and bring that passion to the table. And when the project came up to score an ID for TCM, it was a natural yes for us. We're doing an ID that says, hi, you're watching TCM. This ID is the journey through decades of cinematic history, but it's also a journey through decades of cinematic scoring. And you hit references to King Kong, Psycho, Dr. No, To Kill a Mockingbird. This list of movies includes some of the great movie composers as well. You've got Bernard Herrmann, you've got Elmore Bernstein, Max Steiner, and John Barry, and you get to take this trip through this queue of how do you reference and play with these with new modern musical tools and musicians. And it's so fun to watch those things come from black and white into color, and from color into three dimensions, and then from three dimensions into something like, whoa. All that sound. So for me, the first thing is to identify the tempo of the piece and find the melody. And I will work on that melody longer than I will work on any other piece of this process. You have about six notes. For me, what I I'm I'm really good at being your gut. That note right there? Yeah. Play something for me and I'll be like, perfect. This is where you're on it. And when you can nail the theme for whatever it is, when you can boil it down to its essential, the rest is orchestration. That is the part that gives me goosebumps head to toe, is when I'm standing on the other side of the glass, I've got the score laid out, and it's the downbeat of bringing that music to life. And you get to feel that rush of yeah. all those notes, all those textures coming at you. It's the thrill of making music. One of the things I love about this project is that the musicians and the engineers that we work with, they're all, you know, maybe in their 30s, and these people are, are curious and interested and innovating in their field. It's like an entire generation of people facing forward, but looking back. It just inspires me. 